It's amazing to me how many people look for God when things get rough, and that's okay. Let me just say something. People come back to God, people come back to church when things fall apart and they realize that their resources can't fix it. When they've got it all together and Sunday comes, you can find them in Central Park and during the football season, they'll be in New Jersey at the Meadowlands or they're at kids' soccer games and in bed. But how many know this? When a battle comes, you have everybody saying, get up, kids, we're going to church today is what they're doing. And that's okay. I want you to understand because that's the story today that I want to take you to. I want to say this. Some, I want to say something to you today. It's... it's, it's um, It is a profound description of God's character that's not talked about too much. It's the humility of God. God doesn't ask us to be humble, and he's not humble himself. Talk about humility. This this thought from even C.S. Lewis challenges me when he says this. He says, God is not proud. He will still have us when we have showed we've preferred everything else to him. That's amazing to me. Where everyone else would shun us, God goes, you can try everything else that's out there, but you're going to find that there is an emptiness there until you come back to me. And that's what God does. And I believe today that God wants to bring us on a journey today to show us that we, on this path, when we find the resources are gone, when we find everything's gone, we're going to end up right where God is. And God, in his humility, will say, I still love you and I still want you. The term ditch digger is a term of menial tasks, ditch digger. It's not complimentary, though it's legitimate work that could be you, that could be said today. And I want to show you today how God turned three Old Testament kings and their armies into ditch diggers, which turned their whole battle around. God gave them a menial task to be obedient to, and then God gave them a memorable victory. Just from digging ditches to victory. You're going to see their story today. Those ditches that these men would dig and that army would dig would not only get them water, but those ditches that they would dig would defeat an enemy that they were afraid of. I'm going to show you their story today, and I want to tell you their story. And in fact, today, as we go through their story, it may even sound like your story. And their story is about this, and it comes really from a place in my own heart today that I'm preaching to myself, and I want to show you how I'm even navigating these waters. It's this. What do I do when the battles keep coming? What do I do when they keep coming? When they keep, and they just won't stop. And you're going to find it in men that started digging ditches. That's their story in 2 Kings chapter 3. I want you to go there with me in 2 Kings chapter 3. Now, I don't know about you, but when I mentioned that, Um, today, this generation, they don't have to memorize where the books of the Bible are. They just go on their phone and just hit some kind. When I, when I grew up in order to know where second Kings was, you had to know it was between Samuel and Chronicles today. You just go on here and click and punch and do all that stuff. But you need to find if you have a, if you're one of us like cave people, like I am, and you have a Bible in your hand, it is between Samuel and it's between Chronicles. And you're going to find this book of second Kings. Israel was facing a battle They could not win on their own. And instead of going to God, they began to inquire. They needed two more nations to help them fight. In fact, in this battle, there were three kings that were going to fight together against a common enemy, Moab. It was going to be Israel, Judah, and Edom. Israel was the one that was in the battle. They invite Judah and then eventually invite Edom. And they're going to fight a formidable foe of Moab. We only know two kings' names in this whole story. And they're going to be important. The first king of Israel at this time is Jehoram, and the king of Judah is Jehoshaphat. I want you to keep those names in mind. It tells us at the beginning of it, it says, now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel and Samaria the 18th year. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, reigned for 12 years. But here's the gist of their story. The three kings are on their way to fight this one battle with insurmountable odds. And right in the midst of getting ready to fight this battle, stay with me now, another battle occurs in the midst of the first battle. It's back-to-back battles. The first battle seemed difficult, but now the second one seems impossible. Here's what I've learned, especially not just over this last week, but I've learned this. A battle 
challenges your faith, but a back-to-back battle messes with your mind. How many know what I'm talking about? It's that first battle, you're just going, God, increase my faith. But that second battle is, where are you, God? Because it messes with your mind when you're faced with that. And their first battle was big enough, but this second battle seemed to be crushing. That we, some of us have been in that spiritual fight, and as you're fighting, you can't even catch your breath, and another battle is put on top of the battle that you're already fighting. Who am I talking to today? I just want to make sure that I'm not the only one going through this. Okay, six others. Now stay with me just for a second. If, you, if you're not in that, it's coming. My, my Elder Jerry and, and our elders know this. My personal motto at TSC for the last two years is this. Constant battles, promise victory. Constant battles, promise victory. No matter what comes, there's victory on the other side. It seemed that even this week, the battles did not stop. They kept coming. You start in one, and you can't even finish it, and another one comes. And it's overwhelming when your battle gets intensified with something else, and you're not even finished. And I just kept thinking, God, this is is what's happening. This is what I'm faced with. I literally stood back and asked God this week. This is what I asked him. This was my prayer. I said, God... Can you just give me some breathing room? Can you, can you just, I'm, I'm letting you into my prayer closet. And, but I didn't say it that way. I just, I, I was yelling it at God. Can you just give me some breathing room? Just some margin before the night. Can you just give me a little bit of, can I rejoice for just 10 minutes before the next battle even shows up? Just give me a moment. I'll praise you. But, but just give me a moment. You're faced with a physical challenge, and then before you can even get the faith for that, something goes haywire with a child. Your marriage is hanging on by a thread, and just before you can get a handle on the faith of that, of the position and future at your job is in jeopardy. That's what happened to these three kings and second kings. They were getting ready to fight an enemy that they didn't even think they could win unless they put together three nations, And let me read to you about what the battle gets put on top of what they're faced with. Here it goes. When Jehoram looks at them and says, will you go with me to fight against Moab? He's saying this to Edom, and he's saying this to Judah and Jehoshaphat. And he said, I'll go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. And he said, which way shall we go up? And he answered, and I'll come back to this in a second, because Jehoram is not a godly man. His, his, okay, and here's why. His mom is Jezebel. Okay, we already know we got problems. And his dad is Ahab. So this is, and he's no better. In fact, let me just throw this in there. That he's more dangerous than they are. Because the Bible says, if you read the beginning of that, when he becomes king, it says he removed the idols, but he clung to the sins of the past. Which is almost like saying, hey, I'll go ahead and I can be religious when I need to be religious and I can be sinful when I need to be sinful. That's a dangerous man. When I need to call on God, I'll call on God. And when, and when, I'm, with my, when I'm with my friends, I know how to do that. And he says, which way are we going to go? Jehoram goes, let's go by the way of the wilderness. Bad choice. Look at the next verse. It says this, so the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. Those are our three kings. They made a circuit of seven days and of the journey. And here it comes. And there was no water for the army, for the cattle that followed them. That literally, he takes them on the wrong path. They're on a a path that if they don't die from war, they're going to die of thirst. And they got now, they don't just have a war. Here comes back to back. Now they got a drought. They have no water. Now they're faced with two enormous hurdles. And when the battle got another battle, remember, when it's a battle, it'll challenge our faith. But when it's back to back, it messes with our mind. So what happens is that Jehoram's response, when he gets back to back with battles, 
it goes like this. Listen to verse 10. Then the king of Israel, this is Jehoram, said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. Do you, do you see what he was saying? He says this. This is the messing of the mind. You know why this has happened? God is, set, is setting this up. God is against us. God is trying to kill us. Look, look at what happens when all of a sudden he goes from saying, okay, I need help to fight this. Then all of a sudden back to back. And now he's faced with this. God is against us. God's setting this up. God, he's, and now he's starting to, instead of looking for God, he's blaming God. That's what happens when that battles start coming back to back. It starts to mess with us. God is against us. God is turning against us. And he blames God. Here it comes, church, because he has no track record with God to know how God sets people free and delivers them. I heard one person say it like this. He says, if you say I believed in God and trust God and he didn't come through, you only trusted God to meet your agenda and not what God's agenda was at that point. And that's what I've seen take place. But what do you do? Here's the question. Because I want to share with you how I've started to find my way out of this. What do you do when the battles keep coming? What do you do when it's back to back? What do you do when you're faced with Moab and a drought? What do you do when you're faced with a marriage issue or, or you're faced with physical challenges and then you're also faced with a family challenge? What do you do when it comes back to back when they just keep coming, when it just becomes part of our life? Here's what I found out that brought me through this week, and I hope it becomes encouragement to you. When I find myself asking the question, what do I do when the battles keep coming? Here it comes, folks. I need two things. I need the people of God, and I need a word from God. Those are the two things that I need. Let me say that again. When those battles keep coming, I need the people of God, and I need a word from God. Those are the two most important things that God has helped me with in those seasons when it goes back to back, back to back. Let me explain this to you. Number one, I need the people of God. As one king blames God, get this now, another king says, let's find a godly man. As I, I don't need, when I'm finding, I'm hanging out with people that blame God for everything, I'm telling you, they don't bring me closer to victory. I need to hang out with people that go, let's find the people of God because they're going to speak faith and hope into our life. Don't keep me away from that. So here's what happens. So when the king goes, God's setting us up, look what Jehoshaphat says. Jehoshaphat said, is there not a prophet of the Lord here? that we may inquire of the Lord by him. And one of the kings of Israel's servants answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat is here, who used to pour water on the hands of Elisha. And instead of Jehoram wanting help from God, and he chooses to blame God, thank God, thank God for Jehoshaphat that says, listen, I don't want to hang out with you. If you're just going to keep blaming God, let me find the man of God that I can get some encouragement. I met a precious sister last Sunday as I was walking through the front door of the church and I was talking to her and I said, how long have you been coming? She goes, last week, which would be two weeks ago. She said, I got saved a week ago. I became born again just a week ago. So this is my second week here. But in between being born again and my second week, I got diagnosed with cancer. I asked if I could tell her a story. She said, in between being born again and finding out I have cancer, and all of a sudden, what she also found out was this, that she has also prayer warriors around her. That she didn't just get diagnosed with cancer, folks. She also got godly people. And right there, we laid hands on this precious sister. And we said, God, you're able to heal. You're able to set her free. You're able to provide a miracle. Let me just tell you something. When you get born again, you get the family of God. You get the people of God. And folks, I'm telling you how important this is. You, when you become a Christian, that's why you've got to find the people of God. They're the ones that can get a hold of God for you. One of my favorite stories of finding the right people is I was reading the story of a woman who received a call that her daughter was sick and she needed her meds at Dwayne Reed. So she stopped by Dwayne Reed to get the medication, got back in her car, and she found out that she locked her keys inside the car and can't get the meds to her daughter. 
So the woman found an old rusty coat hanger. How many remember those days? A hanger to try to lift up the lock. And finally, as she's sticking it through, she goes, I don't even know what I'm doing. So she bowed her head and just goes, God, I need help. Send someone. In five minutes, a motorcycle, a Harley Davidson pulls up. A bearded man wearing a biker skull rag, a leather jacket, got off his bike and helped. And he says, can I help you? She says, yes, my daughter's sick. I've locked my keys in a car. He said, let me help you. She said within 30 seconds, that key was out. It was open. She was in her car. She hugged the man and says, thank you so much. You're such a nice man. And the man replied, said, lady, I'm not a nice man. I just got out of prison. I was in prison for car theft. He says, and I just got out. And so she stopped right there. And she says, thank you, God, that you didn't just send the people of God, but you sent a professional. God knows exactly who to send at the right time. Hallelujah. Listen, the most misquoted New Testament verse is James 5.16. Listen to it. The effectual fervent prayers, you know this, say it with me, of a righteous man avails much. You know this verse, but here's what's amazing. That's not the whole verse. That's the half the verse. That's the second half of the verse. That verse is for you. It's for finding the godly people in your life. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? You ready for this? Here's the whole verse. It goes like this. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Why? The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. Don't detach those verses. You know what he was saying? That the person that, that you confess to and the person that's praying for you, you ready for this? It's the same person. The godly person you confess to and the godly person who's fervently praying for you, that's the one that you want part of your life. That when you go to someone and say, I've got cancer, I've got marital problems, I'm having back-to-back -back battles. When you're faced with a difficulty, look at me for a second, folks. I want you to get this. When you're faced with difficulty, don't look for simply a friend that you play golf with. You better find someone who gets a hold of God for you. Don't find somebody going like, oh yeah, we're in the same fantasy football. Drop that. I don't need, I need a righteous man that can get a hold of heaven. I don't need you to know me, bro. I need you to know God, bro, so you can get a hold of God. It doesn't matter how close we are. It doesn't matter that you're my best friend. If you don't know God and you can't pray, then you don't get my faults confessed to you. Because when I talk to you, I don't need for you to go, yeah, I feel you. I don't need you to feel me. I need to know, can you cry out to heaven and get a hold of God for me? While Jehoram is going, yeah, God's messing us up. Jehoshaphat goes, find a righteous man. Find a godly man. Let's get, a, let's get a godly man on top of this. That's what he was doing. And he, <laughs> I have to tell you, Elisha shows up and Elisha speaks to Jehoram first. That's the fake Christian. Look at verse 13. So Elisha said to the king of... Let me just say this. Elisha is savage. Listen to this. He goes, what do I have to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and to the prophets of your mother. You know what he was saying to him? He's saying this. Hey, I know you're here. This is Sunday, but why don't you go after your Monday through Saturday gods? Let's see if they help you. Why don't you go to your buddies that you've been holding on to? Let's see if they can help you. All of a sudden, now you need God? All of a sudden, now you're here? Now you're part of this? Elisha said to Je Jehoram, he said, this, I, I know what you're doing here, but thank God for Jehoshaphat. I went this Thursday to something that you've been hearing about called Next Steps. Let, let me tell you what's happening on Thursday nights. It's so powerful. Thursday nights, we have a, a class that, man, whether you've been saved for, for two weeks or for two years, for 10 minutes or for 10 years, I want you to be part of that because it, let, me, let me explain to you what Next Steps is. TSC Next Steps takes you out of the bleachers and puts you on the field with the team. 
That's what it does. Some of you are going like, how do I get out of the Red Sea? Thursday nights. And for those that are watching online, we're working on your part for online. For those in Sudan and the UK and the Philippines and Malaysia and Peru, we're working on your next steps. Um, videos that we're working so you can be part. But let me just tell you, I went from table to table before the team started to share with them four weeks. It's just four consecutive weeks that you get to hear vision and future, vision. We celebrate the past of what God did with Pastor Dave and Pastor Carter. We bring you all the way to the present and show you what God is doing in the future. I went from table to table to hear the amazing stories that you, that you have here. Listen to this. I was talking to Monique, who went across the street. She told me her story. She went across the, we, uh, the street just a few months after we opened up to go see Wicked, and while she was there, she looked across the street from Wicked and saw Times Square Church. So, so what she did was she walked across the street, found out where, 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 when services were, and she's been coming for the last 10 months. She brought to Next Steps last month, last semester, she brought her brother. I met her sister, and she has just gone. I mean, her, her agenda, I'm going to see Wicked, and it ends up, but God's agenda was to get her plugged in and to do something inside of her. I'm just telling you, I started to hear all these stories. I was talking to a young lady. I asked if I can tell her story from Paola from Colombia. She told me this. She said, I've been coming just for two months. She said, I've been having suicidal thoughts. She said, I just got here from Colombia. And she, saw, she said, I thought the thoughts were normal, that you're supposed to have those suicidal thoughts until I showed up at church. And when I learned about Jesus and how to be born again, she said, those thoughts have left me. I showed up on Thursday night and God is doing something special inside of my heart and doing something deep inside of me. My favorite guy that I met, I said, what's your name? He goes, my name is Zeal, Z-E-A-L. And I said, Zeal. He goes, that's it. No last name, Zeal. He go, and he said, I said, well, how long are you? He, I said, how old are you? He goes, 83. I said, how long have you been coming? He said, this is my second time. Came this Sunday, got born again, showed up at Next Steps. 83 years old. I just thought, wow. And this is what I thought about Zeal and Paola and Monique. This is what I thought. And this is what I said. I said, people need to hear your story. Your miracle battle story can be exactly what someone needs to hear to get through their battle. I said, you got it. You can't tell your story unless you're on the field working with us. You can't tell your story. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He said, God always comes alongside of us to comfort us in every suffering. Why? So that we can come alongside those who are in any painful trial. We can bring them this same comfort that God has poured upon us. I can't give them the comfort. I can't. When God comforts, or let me say it this way. When God comforts you, when God answers your prayer, when you begin to get the people of God, when you get a word from God, God doesn't just give that to you. He gives it to you to give to others. He gives it to you to go. Don't just sit there. There are people that need to hear your battle story. They need to hear what's going on. And all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat says, let's hear from Elisha that you need godly people. And here's the part I love. All of a sudden, Elisha is about to give the word of the Lord, but he does something very interesting. I want to take a side note here just for a moment on how the word of the Lord comes forth, because I want to challenge some of you here today. Second Kings 13, 14, this is what Elisha says. Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, he said, I wouldn't look at you nor say, he's still talking to Jehoram. That's the savage part. He goes, I wouldn't even talk to you. He says, you're lucky you're hanging out with the right people. Because if you weren't hanging out with Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't have even answered the door. He says, but what I'm doing is, he said, I'll give you a word. And this is what it says. Bring me a minstrel. And the Bible says this. It came about when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. This is amazing. Don't miss this right now. When, he, when he's ready for the word of God, he said, get the minstrel and let them start praying. I have to pause here for a moment and tell you how significant this is. I have this thing in me that I, I thought, wait a second, who just asked that we get a word from God. It was Jehoshaphat. It was Jehoshaphat that said, 
We need a word from God. Let's, 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 get, let's go to the man of God. Let's go to Elisha. I have this funny feeling that when Elisha got the minstrels out, that Jeho- Jehoshaphat's heart started to jump inside of him going, yes, this is the right thing. This is the right thing. Thank you, Jesus. Why? Do you know it was just a few years earlier in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, which is the same history book like 1 Kings from a different standpoint, that Jehoshaphat was in a battle, you ready for this, against the same people. Look at 2 Chronicles 21. It came about after this that the sons of Moab, that's who they're fighting in 2 Kings 3, and the sons of Ammon came together to make war against Jehoshaphat. So what does Jehoshaphat do? He starts to pray. Listen to what he prays. He says this in verse 12. He says, for we are powerless before this great multitude who are coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you, God. Now here's what's amazing. You ready for this? God speaks to him and he says, you, you need to know this, that I will fight for you. I'm gonna fight for you. So what does Jehoshaphat do by the direction of the Lord? The Bible says this. The Bible says that Jehoshaphat sends out Judah first. Judah are the praise people. They're the minstrels. They're the ones that are singing every praise is to our God. Every word of worship is in one accord. They're the ones that are singing those songs that you were singing today. And here's what the Bible says that happens in in verse 22 of 2 Chronicles. It says this, when they began singing and praising, the Lord set ambushes against the sons of Ammon, Moab, who had come against Judah. So they were routed. They said as they started to pray, God goes, that praise is going to become a weapon. And folks, I want to give you a challenge today. In fact, I want to pause for a second. And those that are watching around the country and around the world, I want to give you a challenge today. And that's this. Don't just, don't just join us in, in the sermon. And then when the sermon's done, you cut out. I want you to listen to me. You may be missing something that God is preparing you to hear the word of God. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? Listen, folks, do you understand the power of praise and worship? The Bible says in Psalm 22, God inhabits the praises of his people, which says when we start praising him, God starts showing up. So when all of a sudden, when you just go, I just want to hear the Bible, you may be missing God getting your heart ready to hear the word of God, and you just all of a sudden find yourself going, I just listened to sermons. Let me just let you know something. If all you do is listen to sermons, and you don't know how to praise, and you don't know how to worship, the danger is you can get information without getting transformation. And all of a sudden, what praise and worship does, it prepares you. So I want to tell you this. Listen, so when the message is over, we always sing one more song. Don't cut off. Start worshiping with us. When the worship is happening and the choir is singing before the word, go, God, sit in my house. Come to my living room. Come right here in my car. Come visit with me so my heart can get ready for the word of God. But what we do is we think we just need the Bible. No, 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 no. Listen to me close. God speaks to worshipers, not simply to listeners. God speaks. I can see all of a sudden, stay with me now. I could see that all of a sudden when the minstrels come, I could see Elijah looking at those soldiers and those kings. Lift your hands. Start worshiping. Don't just sit there and wait for me to preach. Put your hands in there. I could see Jehoram going. And I could see, I could see Jehoshaphat going, I know this sound. I know what this is all about because God begins to bring victory when people begin to praise. God brings victory when people, hey, this is a great moment online and in person to lift your hands and say, God, we're going to be worshipers. Come on, that balcony on this main floor. Just say, God, we worship you. We bless you. We give you the praise right now. Come with your power. Come with the anointing. We need victory in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Some of you are looking at me going like, what is he talking about? 
Let me tell you what you remind me of. Friday night, Cindy and I and our kids, we were watching the Yankee game, and I made popcorn. And I put that bag of popcorn in the microwave, put it in a bowl. What's amazing to me is to look at the bottom of that bowl and to see those kernels that just won't pop. Here's what's amazing. They were in the same room called a microwave. They had the same heat coming on them in the microwave. They were there at the same time in that microwave. But some reason they wouldn't pop. They stood there saying, we're not popping. We're not doing anything. And I'm telling you, some of you are sitting here going, they can do whatever they want. I'm not doing it. But then there are some of us in this place that just strike up the music, just strike up the word, just start with something because when God starts to move I gotta praise him I got to worship him I got to give him glory for who he is it doesn't matter some of you need to pop in this place and say God is able God is able God is able hallelujah Stand with me. I don't, I don't have. Hallelujah. I don't need to say anymore. Where's my minstrels? I need you to play. Hurry up. Run out here. Hurry up. Freddie, get on that thing. Okay, listen now. When that minstrel came, listen now, here's what's amazing. Here's what he says, and this is the challenge. I just don't need the people. If I, I need the people of God, but I also need a word from God. And here was the word. So when Elisha goes, minstrels come. All the minstrels come. All the TSC minstrels come. Freddie, you come down here. Let Devon. I, I need you because I'm going to need your minstrel voice. Okay, listen. Listen now. I need a word from God. Here's what happens. The minstrel start, and the Bible says, Elisha goes, thus says the Lord. Make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you're not going to see wind. You're not going to see rain, but when you wake up the next day, you ready for this? That valley's going to be filled with water so that not only you, your cattle, and your animals are going to drink. And I love this last part. And the, and the prophet says this, and by the way, this ain't nothing for God. Look what he says. This is a simple matter in the sight of God, that he is not only going to give you the water you need, he's going to deliver the Moabites into your hand. You got a battle. You got a war. And let me just say this to you. And here's where we close. So I'm going to mess up all the note people and everybody that's watched. We're going to mess everybody up today. Here we go. Here it comes. This is what he says to them. He says, in your, now get this, Sudan, listen, Taiwan, listen, 51st and Broadway, listen. He says, in your valley, your lowest part, back to back, in your valley, watch this, I'm going to ask you to dig deeper. So in your low moment, this isn't the chance. This isn't the moment to blame God. I'm going to need for you to dig deeper in your low point. He said that he said he's asking him to dig ditches in a valley. He didn't say come up. He says, go deeper, go deeper, go deeper, go deeper. What is, what do you mean? Pastor Tim, what he was saying? Now think about when he was asking them to do this. 
God was saying to them, God, think about the timing. You want me to dig. I'm tired. I'm thirsty. I've got a, I got a battle in front of me and I can't even get a cup of water. And you want me to do what? Go deeper. That in your low moment, what he was saying to them, go lower. Go deeper. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? You ready for this? Listen, God is asking me to dig in that low spot. What does it mean to dig in the valley? It's a decision to dig deeper while you're at your lowest, to dig deeper in prayer to dig deeper in the word, in the Bible, to dig deeper in the body of Christ, into church, to dig deeper into obedience. That when you're at your lowest point and it's back to back to back, God's not going, just stand there. God's going, dig deeper, go deeper, go deeper in your lowest moment. He's saying, and you're going, I'm tired, dig deeper. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm so upset. Lift those hands. The minstrels are here. Lift your hand. And let me tell you what happened. We close here. Remember what he said. You dig. That, that's, I want to stop for a second. Let me just say this. Some of you have looked at people going like, how, is, how come he's got this? How come they're going through that? How come they seem to get victory? You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Because when they went through their low points, they dug deeper. And they dug at a time when everybody else is blaming God and ticked off at God. They dug deep. They dug deep. They said, when, when everybody else was going, I'm mad at the church. I'm mad at this. They said, I'm going to be right there. My hands are going to be lifted up, and I'm going to do exactly what God wants me to do. And here's what happens. God shows up the next morning. This is what we close with. And it happened in the morning. At the time of the offering of the sacrifice, water came. Remember, you're not going to see wind you're not going to see rain, but you're about to see water. Came by Edom, and the country was what? Filled with water. Look what it says. Now all, here, it, it, here's what it says. Now all the Moabites heard that the kings had come to fight against them, and all were able to put on armor, and older were summoned and stood on the border. And here's the part I love. Look at this. They rose early in the morning. This is Moab. And the sun shone on the water, and the Moabites saw the water as red as blood. F folks, don't miss this. What, they, what, what was happening was that the water that, they were, that the Israelites were drinking from was water that looked like blood to the Moabites. Then they said, this is blood. It's, these, these ravines are full of blood. The kings have surely fought against each other. They've slain one another. And here's what's crazy. Now, therefore, Moab said, to the spoil. But when they came to the camp of Israel, they were already refreshed. They already drank their water. They were ready to go. At that point, they're going, we just drank our water. We're ready for this. When they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites arose, struck the Moabites, so they fled before them, and they went forward into the land, and they slaughtered every single Moabite at that moment. What happened was this. It was refreshing to Israel that water to Israel turned to blood for the Moabites. Do you understand what was happening? That God was saying, I can just take your simple act of obedience to dig deeper, that what will happen is this. That while it's refreshing to you, it'll keep the enemy away from you and keep the enemy confused. So instead of you fighting Moabites, just obey exactly what God is asking you to do. Dig deeper at this point. You're in a valley, dig deeper. Find something in you and go, God, here's what I'm going to do. You inhabit the praise of, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going deeper in praise. I'm going deeper in the word. I'm going deeper. I'm showing up for the 10 and the one o'clock service on Sunday and next steps. And I'm going to find this guy named Zeal, who's 83 years old and say, pray for me, Zeal, that I would have that. And that we would begin to just go, God, we're going to dig deeper in this moment. When it comes back to back to back to back, all of a sudden you start to realize that the enemy saw blood in those ditches. The children of Israel got refreshment and the enemy got, saw the blood in that ditch. All I knew I was supposed to do today was this. After going back to back, I felt like God just say, dig a ditch, go deeper in me. Go deeper in prayer. Go deeper in the word. Just go deeper. Just go deeper. And as you go deeper, this is what I felt the Lord say. 
that those that need that those that need it will get water and some will see blood and some are going to get water today some ready for this there's people that are here and people that are watching some are going to get refreshment but some are going to see blood today what do you mean pastor tim i believe it. as i just dug deep let me tell you what some of you're going to see i'm just digging i'm just doing what i'm supposed to do and what i'm digging today is this I believe you're going to see blood. I believe as the minstrels are playing and the word of God is coming, as the minstrels are playing here, that all of a sudden there are people that are on this stage in that choir, a refreshment is coming upon them. That in their valley season and in their drought, in that choir, I know some of you just struck water up there. I hear some of you up there struck water and going like, I'm refreshed, I'm refreshed. But some of you that don't know God are going to see blood, not blood of an enemy, but you're going to see the blood of Jesus to set you free today. That's what I'm believing. That's what I'm believing today. I'm believing if I'm just obedient and I'm digging and I'm digging and I'm digging, I'm going, Freddie, I'm, I just struck water. And in, in, in my lowest point, I just found water. Man, I've gone to a battle through Tuesday. I mean, listen, my battle started on Sunday. Last Sunday, they started. And all throughout this week, every day, it just kept coming. I'm coming. I'm going, those Moabites, find me the people of God and give me a word of God. And the word that came to me was 2 Kings. Dig deeper, Tim. Just dig deeper. Just dig deeper. Just dig deeper. Just dig deeper. I'll refresh who needs to be refreshed. And those that are sitting here today that don't need refreshment, that need to see the blood, you're going to see the blood of Jesus. What does that blood look like? Here it comes. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. It was not paid with silver and gold which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Hallelujah! God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, right now, today, on this day in July, it has been revealed to your sake, for your sake, that through Christ, you have come to trust in God. And you have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. Hallelujah. And some of you are crying out today. And he's come to set you free today. Jehoram. Look at me, folks. Jehoram. Where are my minstrels? Play it. I need you. Because I need them to see blood. <laughs> Let me just say this. Jehoram didn't live. Jehoram wanted his circumstances changed, but not his life changed. He wanted God to fix his life. I mean, fix his circumstances, but not fix his life. Do you know who those kind of people are? Those people date Jesus on the weekends. They date him. Oh, Sunday, got a date with Jesus. Folks, let me just tell you something. When you walk in a relationship with Jesus, it's a marriage. It's every day. Let me just, let me help the religious here, online and here. Jesus doesn't date anybody. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. He doesn't. And today, you can only be changed by saying, God, here's my life. I'm not giving you Sundays. I'm giving you every single day. I'm giving it to you today. I just know, I just know this, that I was called to dig deep this week. That's all I was called to do. And now I just said, God, you're going to have them see blood. That the blood of Jesus is the only thing that could set them free. Not this church, not this message, not this worship, not this choir, not Times Square. Only God can set them free. Let them see blood today. Let them see that it's the blood of Jesus, him dying in your place. That relationship, being born again, saying, God, come into my life and change me from the inside out. God, I need you today. I'm tired of dating Jesus. I want to commit my life to Jesus today. So I'm going to do something that we haven't done in 10 months. Here it comes. Watch online in this place. Every head up, every eye open. I want you to get this now, and I want you to some of you are sitting in this place saying, I'm tired of dating Jesus. And today, I need to give everything to him. And you see it today. You see, 
I've, I've showed up on a sun. I've showed up online. I've showed up just when it's convenient for me. But today, I want him to change me from the inside out. I want Jesus every single day. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I'm tired. Of, I, I'm not Jehoram today. I'm Jehoshaphat. I'm coming in and I want my life changed today. Balcony, main floor. You say, Pastor Tim, pray for me. I need my life changed today. Hold up your hand as fast as you can. Hold it up as high as you can. If your hand is up, balcony, get down here as fast as you can. I want to pray with you quickly. Get out. Just say, I don't care what anybody else, I'm getting, I'm getting this thing right with God today. Quickly, balcony, we're going to wait for you to come down. I believe God has got something. Quickly, wherever you're at, you get down here as fast. Come on, come up close, come up close. God's going to do something today. Come on, come on. Quickly, make your way down. Balcony, we'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Come on, God's going to do something today. God's going to do something today. God's going to do something today. God is calling you. God is going. Quickly, you guys come. Come, move over. Come on, move over. Let's get them. Elders, help me. Help me. Let's get them all. Let's get them. Elders, help me over there. Let's bring them down and move them with for me. Quickly, we're going to wait for you because God wants to do something. God wants to change you today. God wants to do it. Balcony, we're waiting for you. You come on. Come on. Here they come. We're going to believe for God to do something special in these lives today. You're going to see blood today. Those all the way at the end. Come on. Move over here. Come with me over here. This is going to be a moment. God's going to get a hold of you. Come on. You come. Hallelujah. Come on, this is a good moment to lift your hands and just praise Him right now. This is a good moment just to praise Him, just to praise Him, just to praise Him, just to praise Him right now, just to praise Him right now. Hallelujah. Come on, in your home, in your home, on that couch, we bless you, Lord, we bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Oh, God, you're good. Oh, God, you're good. Glory, 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 glory to God be the glory to God. Come on, sing it. Be the glory. With his blood. With his blood. He has saved. That's what he need to do today. He has saved. With his power. Be the We're going to sing it again. He has done. Let them sing it now. Let them sing it. To God be the glory. To God. Be the glory. Come on, sing it, church. Come on, sing it loud now. To God. You're going to join with the choir. Come on, we're going to sing about the blood. Let's sing about the blood. With this blood, come on, let's sing it as loud as we can. This is a good time to lift your hands. With this power.
Now those at this altar, I want you just to look at me for a second. I want you, because I want to challenge you with something. What Jehoram did, not Jehoshaphat, Jehoram's the bad guy. He tried to get everybody around him to help him get through stuff. Let me get this guy, let me get Jehoshaphat. Thank God he got Jehoshaphat. Thank God he got the right guy. In fact, was if he would have showed up at Elisha, remember, if he would have showed up at Elisha without him, Elisha goes, I wouldn't even open the door. However you got here today, however you got online today, thank God someone got you here today. Thank God someone got you here today. You may be standing next to someone who brought you here today. Give them a little nudge going, thanks, thanks, thanks for getting me here today. And let me, and let me just say this. Today is going to be a brand new day. Did, did she bring you? She brought you. Did you bring, did you bring him? She brought you here today. I saw you nudge him. Did you, did he, did you bring her, did you bring him? He, she brought you today. Thank God, Jehoshaphat, you brought Jehoram today. And now, are you guys married? Now we get to have two Jehoshaphats in the house today. That's what we're excited about. God gets to do that. And two friends, you're going, it's not Jehoram and Jehoshaphat. Now we get two Jehoshaphats. And who's this over here? This is your girlfriend. Now you get to, now Jehoshaphats get to date. Instead of that, now you both get to get right with God today. This is the blessing. Now God's going to do that today. God's going to touch your hearts today. Every one of you that are here today, I want you to know you're making the decision to say, God, I see it's, I need the blood of Jesus to tell me. What does that mean, Pastor Tim? When you think of the blood of Jesus, it means there's nothing you can do to get right with God. It's Jesus' death on the cross that makes you right with God. It's by you accepting that. But Pastor Tim, uh, I, 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 once I get everything right in my life, then I'm going to come to God. Mm -mm, that's the wrong way to do it. We'll never get right enough to come to God. We come to God and he makes us right. That's what he does. He makes us right. And today is that day. Jesus calls this brand new relationship being born again. Just as you were born the first time, you need to be born a second time. The first time is physically. The second time is spiritually. This is, it's not nothing, it's anything we can do. The Holy Spirit does the work right now. Remember, we just sang that part. By his blood, he has what? Saved me. That's what's going to happen right now. So I want you to pray with me and, and, and the thousands of people that are watching online and here today. Come on, let's say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin my shame and my guilt and you die for it you faced hell for me so i wouldn't have to go you rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth and a relationship with your father today lord jesus i turn from my sin to be born again okay now we say this part loud god is my father Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.